Welcome everybody to Learn at Lunchtime. We're so glad that you guys could join us today. Go over a couple of things. I am Sherry Trimble. I'm going to be on your tech support here. Um, I am going to turn it over to the State Museum's Program Director, Bradley Smith. Thank you, Sherry. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. As Sherry mentioned, I am Bradley Smith, Program Director at the State Museum, and this is Curator's Choice, a program of our Learn at Lunchtime series. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Cynthia Little. Dr. Little developed the exhibit Game Changers, Pennsylvania Women Who Made History, which opened at the governor's residence in 2019, and then came to the State Museum in early 2020. Dr. Little has a long career as a public historian, having worked in institutions like the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia History Museum. She has been an adjunct professor at several universities, including Rutgers and the University of Pennsylvania. She is one of the founders of the National Women's History Month, and in 2010, she received an award from the Pennsylvania Commission on Women for her significant contributions to promoting awareness of women's history. Today, she'll be talking with us about the Game Changers exhibit. Dr. Little, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Brad. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, be with all of you this afternoon to um, introduce some of the uh, extraordinary women who we featured in the uh, exhibition, Game Changers, Pennsylvania Women uh, Who Made uh, History. So I'm going to start off uh, with giving you some background about how we shaped uh, the exhibition, uh, because I think that will help you kind of appreciate uh, the uh, 31 women uh, that we uh, selected. Um, as Brad mentioned, the impetus for this exhibit was the 100th anniversary of women's uh, suffrage, uh, the right to vote um, in, the, in the year 2020. Uh, we started working on the exhibition in late 2018. Um, this um, doing an exhibition like this where you had to limit the number of people uh, we had uh, wall space issues at the governor's residence where the uh, exhibition opened so we were only able to pick 31 people uh, and today i'm going to try to reach talk about 10 at least 10 of them and perhaps we can talk about more in the q a if uh, if, if people are interested um, doing an exhibition like this presents opportunities and it also presented some challenges. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each side of that and how we ultimately decided on the guidelines that we had to follow um, as we selected uh, the various uh, people who appear in the exhibition. I would just say that on the opportunity uh, side, is that as we started reaching out to historians and uh, around the state um, and sort of gathering lists of potential people that we might want to include. We ended up having so many names. It was just like a wealth of potential women uh, that we could have included. Uh, so of course that was sort of a, a, a treasure to know that there are just so many women who've had such a profound impact um, on life in Pennsylvania, life in the nation and in many cases uh, globally. So that was really wonderful news and very exciting. So we kind of, uh, we could do, keep on doing these exhibitions for many decades at this point. The other thing that was an opportunity uh, was that since the 1970s, there has been a tremendous resurgence in interest in women's history, a direct relation, uh, a direct cause really, uh, I mean, a direct effect really of the, the women's movement that started in the uh, late 1960s. Um, and so that many archives and libraries across the state um, have been collecting in women's history uh, and that certainly made our job much much easier um, as we created this exhibit and the other thing tied into it is that because of the resurgence of women's history in the 1970s much has been written about women um, in history and so we were able to benefit from that but what's the other side? The other side was kind of how are we going to hone this down? Uh, what were the guidelines that we, uh, we decided to work with? 
So what I would, I'm going to list the guidelines that we created to try to, you know, when we craft the exhibit. One is that we wanted to use women who were either born or raised or made their mark in Pennsylvania. So we wanted them to have a direct connection in some way to the state. We also wanted to um, limit ourselves to women who were deceased. Um, and I will just have to add that was a great topic of discussion in the planning committee, but finally we decided that that was where we would want to land. Um, and we also wanted to uh, have women whose um, primary activity that we're featuring took place at some point in the 20th uh, century. We wanted to feature women as best we could from all parts of the state. Uh, and we also wanted to feature women who represented uh, many across all the lines of kind of race, ethnicity, and class. Um, we also finally really get paid a lot of attention to featuring women whose accomplishments kind of spanned a variety of areas, including law, science, human rights, civil rights, broadly defined, arts and culture, biz and business. Um, so that people seeing this exhibit would get a sense of just the wide diversity of areas of accomplishment that have such a profound effect on our world that women made. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to start with the five women that were in the teaser questions, um, if anybody looked at those. So Brett, if you could move to the first slide of Marianne Anderson. Oops. Cindy, would you like to mention these slides real quick? Oh, um, sure, of quick. course. Um, uh, we have, we're showing a few slides of the uh, opening reception that was held at the governor's residence in Harrisburg um, in March, Women's History Month of uh, 2019. Uh, here you, you know, see uh, Governor Wolf uh, greeting some of the people. It was a very uh, well attended event. Uh, I, I recall it fondly with people really enjoying themselves. And um, I was so pleased to see so many guests actually pulling out their cameras and photographing um, the many of the women uh, who were featured in the exhibition. And here you can see, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, Jeannie uh, Bradley Rosing uh, later uh, today. She's the uh, woman that is on the right hand side here. Uh, uh, the, per the woman in the pink jacket is Frances Wolf, uh, the First Lady of Pennsylvania. That's me actually <laughs> speaking with her uh, on the right hand side. Um, uh, at, this was also at the reception. Uh, this is the way the exhibition looks now uh, at this at the State Museum so that you can see all of the uh, women uh, kind of lined up along this uh, uh, kind of curved wall. I haven't seen it there myself, so <laughs> it's a little hard for me to describe, but uh, you can see actually the first person I see here on the right is Grace Kelly. Uh, and then I believe the second person, she's a little bit not so clear, is Stephanie Kolak, who I am going to speak about today. I'll just interject here and note that when we brought the exhibit to the State Museum and uh, finished displaying the, the works, it was about two weeks before we had to close due to the, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So while this exhibit has been up at the museum for over a year, many people have not yet seen it. So we encourage everyone watching to come and visit the State Museum to see this excellent exhibit. Great, thank you. Uh, well, so my, the first person um, is Marian Anderson, who is for many people, I think, a household name at this point. Uh, and today she is perhaps best known uh, for her 1939 uh, outdoor concert that was held at the Lincoln Memorial, uh, a concert in that case made possible by then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. 
And why was that the case? Because Marian Anderson, uh, because of her race, was refused the right to perform um, in Constitution Hall, which is a structure that is owned by the DAR, known as the Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, well known for her interest in civil rights, um, made it possible then for Marian Anderson to perform at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, Marian Anderson was born and raised in Philadelphia. That's when she started getting her first um, training um, uh, as, as a vocalist. Uh, but it soon became clear that uh, the segregation and the racism in American life uh, in the 1920s was going to make it impossible for her to really develop her, her great talent. And so it is less well known that for Marian Anderson to become the contralto that she was, ultimately she had to move to Europe in the 1920s. Um, because there she was accepted uh, on the stage. She had many appreciative audiences. She could perform anywhere. She was able to get the, the voice training uh, that she wanted and needed. Uh, and it was not until the 1930s that she returned to the United States, again confronting, as we know in 1939, uh, a racism and segregation fortunately not quite at the same level as she had experienced uh, in the 1920s. By 1955, uh, she had become the first African American to perform as a member of the Metropolitan Opera of New York. This, for people who know about classical music, is a big step um, because that reality basically opened the doors for other African American vocalists to perform at these very high levels uh, with major uh, companies across um, across the United States <clears throat> and, of course, uh, globally. So that so she was really one of these people who opened doors for for others. Um, can I have the next slide, please, of Stephanie? All right, this is Stephanie Cohen, uh, born in Pennsylvania, uh, in New Kensington. Uh, it's a suburb, I guess one would say, of, uh, of, of the, in the Pittsburgh area. Stephanie is probably not a household name like Marian Anderson. Um, however, I think she should be. Um, she went to college in the Pittsburgh area, uh, and after graduating, uh, she, uh, she had actually originally hoped to be a physician, uh, but she was having some issues with medical school, and she ended up being hired by the DuPont Company in Delaware. And it was there that she became a, really a world-class organic chemist. It was... Uh, unusual for many of us today, it was her first and only job. She stayed with DuPont throughout her career. During that time, she developed a family of synthetic fibers, uh, a family of fibers that was known for strength and for stiffness. And because of what she invented, she was able to save the lives of countless people from severe injury uh, from, uh, or death from bullets and knives. Some of you may be familiar with what she established, but this was what created Kevlar. This strong fiber is what was found, it is today still found in bulletproof vests. And it's also found in airplanes and undersea optical fiber cables and super strong rope used in bridge construction. So I always think of Stephanie when I go across a bridge that has the big cables because it's in, to a large extent because of her work in organic chemistry that we have these strong cables uh, to hold up our bridges. Uh, honoring her work in uh, 1996, she received the National Medal of Technology and Innovation for her transformative uh, research uh, in chemistry. So can we have our next slide, Pearl Buck? Well, I think for many people, certainly women of my generation, Pearl Buck is a household name uh, because she wrote The Good Earth, uh, which was a very popular book when I was a young, young woman. 
Uh, Pearl Buck um, lived in Bucks County, uh, just outside Doylestown on a large farm um, for, for many years. However, when she wrote The Good Earth, um, she was in a different location. But what is the story with uh, The Good Earth? It was this book, a best-selling novel that introduced generations of audiences, both in the English-speaking world and well beyond to Chinese peasant life, something that was not particularly well known beyond China. And for this book, she received in 1938 the Nobel Prize in Literature um, and was the first woman awarded this major honor. Throughout her long life, she published prodigiously both in fiction and nonfiction and on a very, very wide variety of topics, but a special interest of hers always was human rights. I think what is less known about Pearl Buck, but I think makes her really interesting and helps this people understand why The Good Earth was such a, um, uh, an incisive book about peasant life, is that she was the daughter of missionaries. And she had grown up in China. Uh, she was fluent in Mandarin. And as a young woman, she also was part of uh, very high level Chinese literary and political uh, circles. Eventually, Pearl Buck returned to the United States. And at um, that point, she became involved in the civil rights movement that was emerging um, in, in the US. She served for 20 years as a trustee of Howard University, which is a historically black college located in Washington, DC. And she also published frequently in the Urban Leagues magazine, Opportunity. Ever the game changer, by the time 1949 rolls around, she established at her farm in Bucks County, um, an institution known as Welcome House. And this became the first interracial agency in the United States uh, for adoption. And she particularly, because of her background uh, in China, she had a focus especially on trying to find good homes for Amer Asian children, because these children were often not eligible for adoption by other agencies. Um, today, the focus of her foundation is on intercultural uh, education. But there is just no question in my mind that Pearl Buck has had a profound impact on both our understanding of China, of Chinese life, of, of, um, of, of dealing with uh, issues around adoption of children who come from uh, multiple backgrounds. Um, she was really quite an extraordinary person. So can I have my next slide is of Mira Lloyd Doc. So jumping back in time, you can certainly tell by her, <laughs> by her dress and her hat. Um, those of you who live in Harrisburg and or walk around the streets, uh, you might have noticed that there is a historic marker honoring Mira Lloyd Duck. Uh, she was a daughter of Harrisburg, born and raised uh, in the city. Uh, Mira uh, was an early uh, environmentalist and also a uh, civic reformer. Uh, she was uh, quite instrumental uh, <clears throat> in mobilizing Harrisburg's uh, business community in the early 1900s to really beautify and change Harrisburg in important ways. And a lot of the change that she uh, kind of pushed forward, which uh, many of you are able to enjoy today, but she was mainly responsible for creating the 900 acres of park, athletic fields, public lakes, and also dealing with uh, getting a much needed water treatment plan going uh, in Harrisburg. Uh, so she was actually part of a kind of a larger national uh, movement at that same time, you know, to try to uh, make cities uh, and towns more um, uh, sort of welcoming and comforting and interesting places for people to live. But perhaps she is best known as an environmentalist and as a person interested in the vast and beautiful forests of Pennsylvania. 
And that is really where she uh, landed on much of her advocacy work uh, in the early 1900s. Um, she was the first woman, this was in the year 1901, who was appointed to Pennsylvania State, to a Pennsylvania State Government Commission. So she is on the State Forest Pres uh, Preservation Commission for 12 years. And she was not just somebody who showed up at a meeting. She was really very active throughout this period. And so I always feel like when I'm driving across Pennsylvania and I go through the beautiful wooded lands that it is to a large extent because of her work um, that much of this existed. She uh, was very adamant about trying to uh, change the uh, timber practices so that we would have sustainable uh, forest land. So I'm going to digress a little bit because I'm going to talk about one of her sisters. Um, Mira was one of five sisters, um, but this is a little bit of the uh, kind of way in which families um, kind of raise kids because the mother was also very interested in civic reform and the daughters, at least two of them, also uh, follow in that direction. So Mira, younger sister, Lavinia Lloyd Dock, also is, she probably should have been on the list too, <laughs> but she wasn't, uh, but she was also nationally very famous. Uh, she was an important activist in the settlement house movement, particularly in uh, New York City. Uh, she also was a major reformer in the field of nursing uh, and nursing education. And she, and just to sort of touch on the issue of women and the suffrage movement, uh, she was a proud radical suffragist. Uh, she was a member of the National Women's Party that Alice Paul had founded, and she was not shy about uh, putting herself on the line. She was one of the many women involved in picketing the White House uh, for women's suffrage during World War I, for which she and others ended up spending time as political prisoners, um, being force-fed um, at a prison outside of Washington, D.C., uh, she was definitely the radical sister in every way, rather different than her sister Mira, who we talked about. She was also a labor organizer, a socialist, and a pacifist. So two sisters take, taking similar but also very different paths. Can I have the next slide? Uh, the, the final person um, in the uh, teaser category is Gracie Yohara. She's also somebody I would love to have known. Um, she uh, professionally was a social worker in the Philadelphia area, uh, but I think her real love uh, is what I'm going to describe and why she is uh, in Game Changers. Uh, during the Second World War, uh, Gracie Yohara and her family um, lived in one of the many uh, Japanese American internment camps uh, around the United States. Uh, this was for her as well as for others a profoundly difficult uh, experience. After the end of the Second World War, Gracie joined with others in founding the Japanese American Citizens League in 1947. And the purpose of this organization was to get the United States government to formally apologize for forcing Japanese Americans to live in internment camps. Um, she was a leading figure in this very long and difficult campaign. Um, and she used her social worker skills to get people to speak out about their experiences in the camps, which is something very difficult for many uh, many people because it was just such a difficult um, period in their lives. It took until 1988 for the American government to finally formally apologize uh, for putting people in these essentially concentration camps um, during the Second World War. And as part of that, the apology, they offered in former internees um, uh, $20,000 uh, each to partially compensate them for the losses of property and uh, land and homes and so on. Gracie then decided that the, this story 
in American life had to be really out there and public and permanent. And so she then mounted yet another national campaign that resulted in the Smithsonian Museum, uh, the Museum of American History in DC, uh, mounting a very important exhibition um, about, about the internment camps uh, during the Second World War and also this, uh, the Japanese <coughs> American Citizens League also then started contributing um, to the founding of, of, of a permanent museum in Los Angeles actually um, about Japanese American life. Um, so she's just one of these people who was an extraordinary organizer, uh, very good with people, and who basically uh, just was not going to sit down and not say anything about um, what, had ha what had happened to people who were Japanese American. So. Yeah, I'm going to give you guys a time check. It is okay. now 1241, just to let you know. OK. Um, all right. Well, our next slide is of, of, Bar of Barbara Gettings, um, who is a leader in uh, civil rights and an LGBTQ activist. Uh, Barbara, as an adult, lived most of her life uh, in Philadelphia. However, she got her start as an activist in the 1950s, uh, originally in California, and then moved to the East Coast. And it was there that she founded uh, the first East Coast chapter of a group called the Daughters of Belitis. This was a group promoting lesbian civil and political rights. Um, Barbara was really a pioneer uh, in this in this movement, which of course today is much bigger and very accepted. When she started things, this was a very almost dangerous thing for somebody to do. Uh, during the 1960s and 70s, um, she worked with a number of gay rights organizations and participated in many public protests. Uh, one I would like to just feature was called Reminder Days, and Reminder Days were held in Philadelphia between 1965 and 1970, um, right near Independence Hall. And very strategically, they were held on the 4th of, uh, the 4th of July weekend, uh, when there would be a whole lot of people. And actually, in the photograph that you see of Barbara here, she is actually pointing to a photograph of her uh, picketing in front of Independence Hall uh, in the 19, uh, 1960s. Um, the other thing that she is known for uh, is that she was one of the co-organizers nationally of a successful campaign that resulted in declassifying homosexuality as a, as a mental uh, disorder. Um, so this, so she, her work, again, like Gracie Uhars and others, all this organizing, all this pushing, all this putting things forward that had been hidden in the past began to really change American culture. Can I have the next slide? Sure, but first I will just interject again okay. and say, completely by coincidence, we realized in discussions that this uh, exhibit that Barbara is, is looking at was curated by Dr. Cynthia Lill. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's a small world. Small world. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, here here is uh, Jenny um, Jenny Bradley Rosing. Uh, this is also a story about women's women's suffrage, just to kind of tie in with uh, the, the 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 theme here. Um, uh, Jenny uh, was from Pittsburgh, born and raised, uh, and she became a leader uh, in the Pennsylvania women's suffrage movement uh, in 1904, uh, when she co-founded the Allegheny County Equal Rights <coughs> Association. Um, she was, again, like some of these others, she was a superb lobbyist and she had excellent organizing skills. Not to mention she was a woman, and you can even see it in her smile, she had boundless energy uh, for uh, 
for her cause. Um, so much to the point that, and I'm going to describe one of her big campaigns in, in uh, Pennsylvania, but that she came to the attention of what the major national women's uh, suffrage organization, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and she became its chairwoman in 1912. However, her Pennsylvania story, which is a story I just love, is that she, um, she was one of the key organizers, uh, as well as people kind of driving the car, that organized and participated in a four-month tour of the Liberty Bell of Justice. Now, most of you probably don't know about the Liberty Bell of Justice, sometimes known as the Women's Liberty Bell. It was a replica of the, uh, of the Liberty Bell at Independence Hall area. Um, but um, this particular Liberty Bell was specifically um, it actually funded and constructed to promote women's suffrage. Um, and it had a feature uh, to demonstrate that women did not have full rights because its clapper was going to be silenced until women got the right to vote. Well, in um, right before the, uh, a suffrage amendment was going to come before the Pennsylvania State uh, Senate, uh, Jeannie and other women suffragists um, decided that they would take this Liberty Bell on a four month tour on the back of a flatbed truck. Okay, this is like in like 1915, roads were not great. And they literally went to 67 counties, they went to small towns, they went to rural areas, always holding big kind of celebrations with everybody, all the women and the children dressed in white and lots of uh, talks and so on and so forth. So it was kind of a big entertainment uh, to build a support for suffrage across the state. Sadly, the amendment uh, went down to defeat in the Pennsylvania State Senate. However, that defeat was narrow and it basically re-energized the suffrage movement in Pennsylvania and they eventually were uh, successful. Um, so she, again, is part of this, this theme, I think, of all this ability to organize and bring uh, good things done. Do we have time for another slide before we break? One more. One more, okay. We will get, oh, this is one more. Um, this is uh, Judge Genevieve Blatt. Uh, she uh, is often called the first lady of Pennsylvania politics. Um, she was the first uh, woman in Pennsylvania to be uh, voted into statewide office in 1954. Uh, she served as the Secretary of Internal Affairs for three terms. Um, she, this basically opened the way for other women to run for statewide office, which of course now you can see that women are taking these kinds of roles everywhere, but much of it begins with Genevieve Black. Um, in 1964, uh, she ran, um, she became the first woman nominated by, an, uh, by a major party to run for the US Senate. She was not successful in that campaign, but nonetheless, this was kind of one of these door opener type of moments. Um, but I think what she is best known for and what many of us experience today, especially if you are interested in sports, is that when she was an appellate judge on the Commonwealth Court, she wrote the 1975 landmark opinion uh, on Title IX that gives girls equal access to inter, uh, interscholastic sports. So, she is somebody who every time the you know girls go out on the soccer field or um, wherever uh, Genevieve is the person who really began to make it possible for them to have some equality in terms of the equipment and access to scholarships and so on so so Great. are we yeah are we I think at a time break for q a or where we are we? at a good time and remember everybody um we're using the q a box uh for any questions that you might have i'm kind of going to put in a, an interesting personal story um my father uh worked for the commonwealth court um and when i was oh 
I'm just going to say a young teen girl. Um, uh, I met with uh, Judge Blatt at the time. Uh, she was a great influencer. She not, you know, young teenage girls coming into the office, um, you know, she was great to talk to and encourage us to uh, mm -hmm. explore careers. And uh, yeah, it's just a really great woman to, you know, push people forward. And I think that's probably true for most of these women. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, of course, without actually knowing it, it's hard to say. I mean, having your personal story is, is very, uh, is, is helpful to kind of get a feeling about how, you know, some of these women really would be very open to, you know, to helping other women kind of think that, you know, they could expand the horizons of their life. So interesting thing. Uh, yeah, we could probably go because we don't really have many questions here. One, oh, okay. one thing that somebody commented on is the longevity of some of these women. Many of them lived really long lives. You know, it's, it's interesting somebody commented on that because I have noticed that when I've been doing research, I'm often looking at the length of, of act, women who are active as their lives. And both in the 19th century and well into the 20th century, many of them have very long lives. I've kind of thinking like, well, maybe the message is, is that being an activist um, kind of gives you a long and interesting life. Do you, did you find in your research that um, their activists started when they were younger or older or sort of a mix? Some of it depends on the century that you look at, I think. Uh, for example, I mean, and I'm just going to be kind of a broad brush, but when I've looked at women in the 19th century, especially from about 1800, 1860, 70s, Often the most activist period is um, really after their after their forties. Uh, you're probably starting in their forties because uh, they have usually had, in many cases, a lot of childcare uh, responsibilities and running large households at a time when there were, you know, like no electricity and so on. Um, you know, so that. I think it, earlier on, if if the woman survives childbearing and is not hit by the epidemics and so on that affected so much of the country during the early 19th century, that um, you know it would be in their 40s that they would really start having more time to be active. I sense a shift actually by the time you get into the late 19th century. Um, because then you have more women getting some higher education. Um, and so they're not necessarily getting married as young. And they often are starting, particularly by the 1890s, to have, you know, some years of having careers outside the, you know, outside of kind of the home family thing, um, that some of them are, are younger. Um, and that, I think, starts to, um, be also visible in the uh, in the 20th century. And the other big break uh, break point, I think, on the age question is that if the woman is married and has children, that those women tend to wait longer to have lives that are kind of outside the family and activists. I mean, now there are always exceptions, but that's kind of my sense. Whereas women who are single and who have resources often from family that can be independent, that their activism, it tends to be much, uh, much earlier. And for example, you somebody like Mary Lloyd Daw came from a well-to-do family. She had her own resources. She never married. And so activism was her career. Uh, Jeannie uh, Bradley Rosing, who we just looked at, she was divorced um, uh, fairly early in her life. And it was after the divorce that she really takes off as an activist. We do have a question in our Q&A box. Uh, someone asks, have any of these women been introduced in elementary or uh, elementary through high school curricula? Well, that's always an interesting, an interesting question. Uh, 
I think it probably will. I'm trying to. Uh, uh, I would. My guess would be it's a lot is going to depend on the school, and on the the particular uh, teacher. I mean, I will just say, kind of talking about some of my own experience when uh, our group at Sarah Lawrence College in 1979, we were part of a. Uh, a seminar, a summer seminar at Sarah Lawrence for leaders of the women's movement. And when we decided that our major project was going to be to create a celebration of women's history, which becomes Women's History Month today, um, that actually the idea came from somebody who herself was an elementary school teacher. She had started doing this in California. Um, so our one of our main goals was to try to infuse not only women's organizations, but also the school curriculum with women's history. My guess is it's been kind of an uneven type of thing. Um, but it was the National Women's History Month group that also became involved with having a catalog of books and all sorts of materials for teachers to use, and that still exists. And some some use it and some don't. I, you know, I, I'm sometimes kind of surprised, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way, when I talk to educators about whether they are really actively including women and, and women's history, you know, in their curriculum. Just to piggyback on that, when I'm not at the State Museum, I'm an adjunct. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Brad. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, when I'm not at the State Museum, I'm an adjunct history professor. Mm -hmm. And in the 20 years I've been doing that, I have noticed in the texts we use that um, women's history is more prominent than it was when yeah. it first started. Well, I think, yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely better than it was. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I ever knew of a woman when I was in school. I mean, I, it didn't hit me that women had a history until I was in graduate school. I mean, that's pretty sad. Um, I know that in the Philadelphia area, and I think this may be true across Pennsylvania, that students involved particularly with a program called National History Day. I know that in national, the program in the Philadelphia area that that has been um, a great source of encouraging uh, projects around women's history as well as on African American history. Um, and that there has been a lot of, um, through National History Day, we have, a number of us have worked a lot with teachers and with students to encourage them to select these types of projects um, uh, to, you know, to feature. Dr. Would you like me to talk about Daisy? Sure. Lampkin, <laughs> I like I like her. <laughs> um, let me get my um, uh, Daisy. Daisy Lampkin uh, was was a powerhouse. Just no way no way around it. Uh, she was born in Reading, but she lived most of her life uh, in Pittsburgh, and that is where she kind of begins to make her mark. She is a person who has a long time, a lifelong commitment to activism, to both women's rights and to civil rights around uh, race. Um, she was a major stockholder <clears throat> in the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a newspaper serving um, the, the city's uh, Black community. And through her uh, involvement with that newspaper, she was able to do a lot to influence uh, public opinion. She was known for a very persuasive speaking style. And that's also like many of these other uh, women we've talked about, she had exceptional organizing skills. And she became uh, the field secretary for the, uh, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People uh, for 18 years. And as this field secretary, she traveled all over the state and, all, and into many um, other states uh, promoting uh, civil rights. She also, and I think perhaps a little less well known, was also deeply involved in the women's club movement, which uh, whether it was in the white side or the African American side was one of the largest reform movements uh, in, the, in the country. 
Uh, <clears throat> and she was also very active in the suffrage movement. Uh, there, I mean, often people don't under, don't know just how involved many African American women uh, who were leaders in their community were involved in the suffrage movement. She was one of them. She was also very involved in the consumer rights movement, uh, as well as in the anti lynching uh, movements. In 1935, she worked with uh, Mary McLeod Bethune to help establish the National Council um, of Negro Women, which is based in Washington, D.C., still to this day. Um, and that group, the National Council of Negro Women, basically was working to take issues that had been handled locally and to give them national visibility uh, uh, and, and, and also to find solutions. So she, um, she's really a major figure, uh, not as well known as uh, she, she deserves. <laughs> But then we could say that for a lot of women. Brad, is there a question or should we go to uh, Helena Devereaux? I do have a sort of a question. Someone asked if we could share resources about the women in Game Changers. And my suggestion is that I think it would be easiest for us to share that in our post presentation email follow. -up. Oh, OK. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. I did have one thing I wanted to ask you about, Dr. Little. In, uh, in today's presentation and also in our conversations, you've talked about how difficult it was to review all the possible candidates and narrow down the list <laughs> right. to a select few. As you look back, is there anyone that you really wish you could have gotten in? Someone that really just, oh, you wish you would, if you had one more slot, yeah. you would have included oh, yeah. her. <laughs> Tell us about that person. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, oh gosh. Yeah, the, the one person who, well, I, I, in a way, I, I had wished that I, we had been able to include Lavinia Doc, who I spoke about today, uh, married uh, Lloyd Doc's sister. Uh, but the other person who I could just kick myself that we did not include was Jane Jacobs, who was the uh, very well known uh, urbanist who really, um, uh, uh, really was a person who 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 started to uh, I'm trying to think how to put it in the in the 1950s basically a lot of people just did not think that urban life was something that was positive and Jane Jacobs who at that point she had grown up uh, in in Scranton area, but when she married, she and her husband ended up in the New York City area. And she was one of the leading figures nationally uh, to really promote urban life, uh, to uh, uh, fight some of the um, uh, efforts, uh, particularly in New York City, but we certainly see this in other urban areas across the country. I know it's been part of what's happened in Philadelphia. Um, you know, to kind of crisscross urban areas with highways because nobody really cared about the fact that there were all these neighborhoods. And she was one of the major spokesperson uh, on that on that issue and also on how how much land was going to be used for building like huge high rises and how much land would be used for parks and greening and things like that. It's a little bit like Mira Lloyd Jock of an earlier time period, uh, but it is Jane Jacobs who um, I think when people who study urban history really think about who one of the big game changers was, it was Jane Jacobs. Hmm. So I, I, I was very sad about that. <laughs> But there we are. At least we get to talk about her today. Oops, that was me. Sorry. Oh, OK. Do something. So go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I have to grab something from the chat box. I am actually um, putting in the chat box to some wrap up information. OK. Brad, I'll let you do concluding marks here. Oh. Well, Dr. Little, this was this was wonderful. We thank you so much for joining us today. And Sherry has put uh, her email address in the chat box. So if any of you have additional questions you'd like to ask, please send them to Sherry and Sherry will make sure that Dr. Little received them 
receives them. And yeah. um, we'll be in touch next week with a post presentation follow up message. Yes. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us for Learn at Lunchtime. Um, as you look at our upcoming uh, conversations, you're going to notice that there is not one next Friday, Happy Memorial Day. We're going to be enjoying a weekend <laughs> off, uh, taking that time off. But then we're going to be back on June 4th um, with one of our artist conversations. And we've got butterflies. The, the grand review will be your next one, Brad. Um, talking about the um, parade that celebrated uh, the colored troops after the Civil War. More information to come on that one, right, Brad? Correct. Yeah, we're just finalizing the details today. Yeah, so keep an eye out on that one. We'll be posting more as it goes. And then our director, Beth Hager, will be back on June 25th with uh, Walter Mashaka uh, to talk um, about outreach in our community. So thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the sunshine and the heat. And thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>